Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their yarn, knitting and comedy in equally large measures. I'm your host, Joe Milmire, and coming up in today's show, we have a book review of a new South African knitting book. I have a giveaway for you, sponsored by Linda of Coach House Yarns. And we welcome Claire and Kate back to the podcast to talk about which needles to use for sock knitting. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the podcast. Choose your weapon. Today is Sunday the 23rd of November. How are you all? How have you all been? Have you all been busy? You getting a bit excited about Christmas yet? I'm a bit excited. We've been out this evening, uh, sorry, last night uh, to watch the local Christmas lights being switched on. It's very exciting. And uh, came home and decided that we we're going to put up the Christmas tree and we can't find the Christmas tree, the black plastic Christmas tree of podcast fame that I've had for about five years. We can't find it. I think we might have chucked it out. I think we had a conversation about chucking it out and I think I kind of gave up the battle in the hope that something else wouldn't get chucked out instead and that uh, Mimi got to chuck out the Christmas tree that is hated for ages and now we can't find it. It's a bit of a shocker. Um, I think it might be in the garage. I think it might be. I just don't think he's got to it yet but yeah... I, I quite like to, to book the trend and get the fairy lights out as early as possible. I, in fact, I'd have fairy lights all over my house all year round if um, my husband would let me, but uh, he's a little bit conscious about the energy implications of such frivolities, so I, I don't get to, to have them the whole time, unfortunately. We've just got back from a little trip down south, down to the north of England in the last couple of weeks. It's quite far. It's quite far and that 60 mile an hour speed limit on the A9 is a pain in the bum. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not entirely sure whose brainwave of an idea it was but I have no idea how on a road where people have accidents because they get so frustrated at being stuck behind someone at 60 it's going to reduce accidents. I think it's just a massive cash cow thought up by someone in the central belt who never goes up the A9. It's the first time I've I've actually had to use the road since they switched all the cameras on and it it makes me pretty cross. And thoughtfully, they've slowed down all the HGVs to 50. Nice one. Yeah, you can still overtake them at 60, but it's not the best idea. Surely the whole point is to get past them as quickly as possible. Um, So we set off at 3 in the morning so that the kiddies would go back to sleep on the way down there because it's about six and a half hours if you don't stop obviously we do have to stop because we have children and dogs and um yeah it was pretty emotion to say the least we set off at 10 to 4 got up at 3 set off at 10 to 4 to drive down there luckily we got to the noble town of wigan at about lunchtime and we could go to the the pie shop and and get pasties because that's like a tradition now my husband is is fascinated by this northern tradition of eating pies and in particular fascinated by the price of said pies and um, even in the expensive pie shop which is um green Alches, but it's not spelt green Alches, it's spelt green halls but everyone calls it green Alches. it's just how we do things up north they're the best ones but they're not from wigan they're actually from bolton and uh, they make a vindaloo pie which i introduced him to um a few months ago and he loves that he thinks it's the best thing ever so um He quickly trotted off around there. But there's this weird thing about pie shops in that they don't seem to conform to any of the normal kind of retail standard practices, such that if you turn up at half past 12 and you want something, generally it's gone. There is nothing there. They don't think, you know what, we're open till half past four, so let's put in a load more pies so we have stock to sell to people. No, it's just, if you get there at half twelve and it's gone, then it's tough, love. You can have the weird kind of potato pie that nobody ever wants, like a butter pie. No butter in it. You'd think you'd open it and it'd be like a big slab of butter. It's not, it's just random bland potato that nobody's ever going to want. That's all there is left. So um, 
he was quite happy because he got to go there early and get all of the goodies that he wanted to get and he gets the little gingerbread men that they make and well they're not men it's a scooby-doo gingerbread normally i'm sure they don't have the copyright for that but yeah whatever and um he has a great time with that i'm a big fan of the meat and potato pasty with flaky pastry not the meat and potato pasty with the short crust pastry which is also available but is not as nice um, so if you're in the north and you're wondering which pie shop to go to, don't go to the Pound Bakery. It's pretty much rat and dog in their pies. And Greg's is for losers. Sorry, we're too commercial now, guys. Um, you want to get yourselves down to, to Green Green Halches, Green Halls. And uh, if you're southern, just ignore the last five minutes because you probably don't eat pies anyway. So yeah, that was that. We went down south because it was um, Little Sanimals christening. Um, yeah, he's, he's like 20 months old. <laughs> you know, it's like a second child syndrome, a bit of a slacker. And so we took him down and we went down there because it's kind of halfway for all of me and his family who live on the south coast. And all of the godparents live in Wigan as well, apart from one of them who's Millie's brother. But they actually know how to use a sat-nav in a car, so it's completely different. And... Um, we went along to the church, and it's the same church that uh, of the school that I used to go to when I was a kid, so it's full of memories uh, for me, and bless him, the, uh, they had the big old Victorian marble fonte, and they did the whole water thing, he was quite confused by the water on his head, he was not really sure what to make of it, and then uh, Millie's dad said, oh, let's have a picture, and we all turned around, and Sam just shoved his foot into the font, into the holy water so I'm fully expecting that he's going to become a footballer when he grows up now it'll be, probably be that the winning goal he'll score it with his, his holy foot so <laughs> was his right foot as well um and we all went along to the pub for afterwards and had potato pie because we're northern that's all you eat is pie pretty much when you're down there and uh, a good time was had by all really disappointingly because it's winter most of the time I spent in the car on the way there and the way back um I couldn't knit, it was too dark, and I was very tired, so um, I didn't get a lot of knitting done, unfortunately, and I didn't get a lot of podcasting done because I was absolutely shattered, so I just thought, oh, you know what, I'll just, uh, I'll roll with it, because we also had the uh, release of next year's club for the Golden Skein, um, in the last, since the last time I podcasted two weeks ago, which has been obviously very busy, and there's been lots of chatter about that, lots of excitement, and um general whooping and stuff so yeah it's been it's been a little bit busy than I, I thought it was going to be but it's all good fun and uh, I saw obviously saw Kate well, I didn't obviously see her but she was there Kate our co-host in the sock segment came along to um to Sammy's christening in her new car that isn't a mini but I'll put that in the outtake so you can have a laugh along with that and um so yeah, I'm, I'm back in the room now, I'm back up north, getting some wear out of my new baby alpaca hat, and I'll talk about uh, my knitting and what I've managed to get done in the next episode. Um, but coming up, I'll just quickly at this point say thank you very much to Gemma for leaving me a very kind iTunes review. I really appreciate you taking the time to do so. And if anyone else does have a chance to quickly pop on there and leave a review, then I would be very grateful. So I think we'll move on to the book review. So I'm very excited to be able to review this book for you today and introduce it to you. Some of you will already have seen it around, particularly if you're one of my listeners that went over uh, to listen to Sally's podcast uh, when she started podcasting. She does a video podcast. And uh, Sally's also known as Pink Hair Girl, so you will have heard her mentioned on my podcast before. And as you'll know, if you've listened to my back catalogue, I met Sally in South Africa when I lived there. She lives down in Cape Town on the, uh, to the very south of South Africa, Western Cape, in Cape, well, just north of Cape Town. And uh, lives there with the geek, who's her husband that she met on Twitter. He's very nice. And uh, the three pinklets, who are a little kiddies and um Rachel has been a long time listener of mine since she was very small and I think she's also starred in a few episodes of uh, of Sally's podcast that I still need to catch up on I'm awful with video podcasts I'm even worse with video podcasts than I am with audio I really need to make more time to listen to them but I'm always running around doing crazy stuff but hey it's not about me it's about Sally's book 
and uh, she has just released uh, her first kind of proper book collection which is called Mzanzi South Africa on my needles. Mzanzi means uh, south or down in Zulu and please don't laugh and laugh at my pronunciation because I can't there's a funny click there's a kind of in it that I can't do but it's Koza Koza I can't do it the South Africans can do it it's spelled X H O S A it's one of the um, 11 South African languages and uh, it basically that's kind of the south in South Africa and she has teamed up with her friend Andre Van Royen or Van Royen uh, to produce a knitting collection now Andre uh, has started in one of her podcasts recently uh, and took her driving on a drive really really fast um, <laughs> And he is a landscape photographer, he's based in Cape Town and he's a friend of Sally's and he's actually inspired quite a bit of her work. I think it was him that inspired uh, the Guardian Angel shawl and talking, you know, talking to him about that and now she's moved on to her knitting book. It is a collection of 15 patterns, uh, most of which are accessories and there's a little jumper for a child as well in there. So it's quite a good range of patterns which will take you on a journey from the very southern tip of Africa, South Africa, Cape Point, all the way up to the northern border and exploring lots of different parts of South Africa, stories of people, how they've inspired the different patterns that she's created. And she's also worked with South African indie dyers uh, to create the collection. Now, I'm going to make no bones about it. I really like this book, mostly because it makes me quite homesick for Africa. When I looked at, at, I mean, I knew that the book was in production. I'd known about it for a long time. I've known that Sally's been working on it for a long time. And when I first got the, the full book to look through and it was finished and I was really excited about it and I started to look through the pictures and the imagery. I was, it made me quite emotional actually I, I could kind of feel sort of all of this stuff welling up inside me remembering all the different parts of Africa and all the things that we'd seen and the people and it really struck a chord with me as someone who'd lived there I'd had the privilege of living there for two years and would actually quite rather like to go back <laughs> um, to South Africa and quite apart from that, I really liked the way that you could totally see the correlation between this beautiful, breathtaking photography, and it is stunning, to how she's interpreted that into like fun and very kind of utilitarian, really, knitting patterns that you could use for a variety of different things. For instance, the first kind of set of patterns as you open the book is the kind of Cape Point collection. This is based on Cape Point, which is the very southern part of South Africa. And there is a cowl, a hat, some fingerless gloves and a shawl within that collection. And the first picture, you're just looking towards this amazing panorama and, and this path leading off towards the the point and the sky and the sea and then next to it on the next page you have um you can see the kind of the angles of the cape point and the colors and all of that is reflected within the patterns um for these these point these these four um accessories sorry and and then there's a picture of like the whole family wearing matching ones and you just think actually yeah they could all wear that you know it's very you could use all different colors it doesn't necessarily have to be the blues and grays that have been used within this to represent Cape Point you could do it with any colors and it's really kind of versatile as a set of patterns um particularly this time of year when you're thinking about gift knitting you could have a full kind of matching set be really cute um so I really enjoyed that and that's kind of topped off by the Cape Point shawl which uh, again takes this kind of chevron pattern and moves it on beyond uh, the kind of family set into a kind of really wearable shawl then you have the table mountain shawl and the table mountain panorama wherever you look at it it's such an iconic part of the landscape and it's I mean most of the time we were in Cape Town it had its its hat on it was always cloudy but 
again the pictures you see the 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 mountain Kip Cape Town. They're always talking about Cape Town. always talk about the mountain, going up the mountain. Well, the mountain looks really nice in this and uh, again then it's a complete another show but it's a completely different feel to it and a lot more feminine um in that pattern and some lovely pictures of sally her hair looks great i mean she does have illuminous pink hair and then as she starts to kind of move north up the country you move away from um the very kind of cape Townian feel to it and it is it does feel quite european i feel in cape town it doesn't feel like the kind of the area of the country that i lived in that feels like proper africa to me it does feel quite modern and and quite european i think it's because of all the white the, the vineyards and things and and the wine areas that give it that feel i'm not sure but um, then you we get into the super cute forest cardigan and there's a very, very cute model on these pictures who may or may not be related to one of our guest, uh, our guest, writer, our guest uh, stars on, uh, on the podcast. Um, but that is really sweet. It's a little hooded cardigan. Uh, and there are a lot of kind of forested areas as well within uh, South Africa, particularly as you go up towards the Drakensberg and towards from where I used to live towards Zanin. There were a lot of big kind of pine forests there that remind me an awful lot of where I live now here in Scotland where you get those massive kind of plantations of forest and pine trees and it reminds me of that and that goes straight into the Drakensberg which uh, and that is a range of again amazing mountains that have inspired the um, Drakensberg hat and mugwarmer patterns the drakensberg means dragon mountain and it does look like a dragon lying down the drakensberg when you look towards it from where i used to live it did look like a lying down uh, dragon amazing beautiful area of the country that you go through as you go towards durban uh, so we crack on after that to the josie socks uh, which are inspired by johannesburg known as josie to a lot of people and designed by our own claire divine uh, she obviously she is a South African you know that and she used to live in Johannesburg and uh, she designed the Josie socks for Sally's collection which are uh, quite a structural pair of socks with quite a bit of texture to them uh, designed in a Heartland yarn and again the picture is uh, it just shows you that kind of um, the parallels that you found within this country from the insane natural beauty to the highly urbanised landscape that you see in Joburg, which is, is not your greens and blues, it's all kind of rust and silver and sand coloured and you get the, the skyscrapers um, and it's kind of like dusty and smoggy and um, I think Claire's really captured that really well in this pattern in particular. I'm actually knitting this at the moment but not in that yarn and it's coming out in quite an interesting way. And then you move across to the kind of Johannesburg's more kind of, I guess, refined cousin Pretoria, which is next to Johannesburg. Um, and she has a pattern called Jacaranda or Yakaranda as it would be. And this is inspired by the Jacaranda trees. Uh, Pretoria is also known as kind of Jacaranda City. And in September, the Jacaranda trees are covered in these lilac flowers and they're all over the city. It's, it is quite urban still, but it's a much prettier urban than uh, Joburg is. And she's got a very feminine, pretty shawl in the colours of a jacaranda tree. Um, pattern for that next in the book. After that, we start to get to my neck of the woods. And things start to become a lot more kind of African looking, which I really like. There's the African fingerless gloves that are based on a kind of very traditional African patterns and it talks about some ladies uh, that she knows as well and the story of how this came to be inspired. And then there's also um, uh, some African fingerless gloves called Dandy, which again are based on traditional beaded patterns but represented within a, a knitted format. And quite fun quite good for kids i think it'd be quite interesting and the full range of sizes from small to extra large within that and then 
again there are, the, there's a lot another pattern uh, for fingerless gloves that is based on a, a beaded kind of mural of a little lady um, there's a lot of beaded things that you find around and particularly like when you're in Pretoria in Johannesburg by the side of the road there are beaders who make things beautiful intricate things that they sell by the side of the road they sell at traffic lights and that's quite often where you'll find quite a bit of this stuff um, and they make some amazing things that I've, I've never really seen anywhere else other than there and I kind of wish I had more of and didn't really get time or the opportunity to buy more of it and then finally you go into the baobab baby pullover now this is my favorite picture in the whole book it's of the baobab tree and north of where i used to live north of the south pansberg mountains you go into the plains before you get to messina and the border with zimbabwe and they are covered in these huge baobab trees and they're just so structural looking and it, I mean it must be easy to take a good picture of these because they are so unusual and the, the the oldest one in the world is apparently up there as well I don't think we ever got to visit to it but some of these trees can be up to 5,000 years old <laughs> so they're, they're pretty old trees and the very often you see them up towards Botswana as well which is where Sally saw them and it's a really cute little pullover with a baobab on the front and then it's got little owls around the sleeves it's so sweet um, and that I think that was the one that kind of got me more than any pattern because it is so familiar and the dust and the dryness and the beautiful blue sky in the pictures is just amazing so I clearly love this book and I'm not gonna mess about I think 15 patterns really versatile something for all the family in there and it really does take you on a journey through south africa that isn't your typical big five let me give you some knitted animals journey it's got some of that kind of traditional Af what you associate with africa hints thereof at it and then there's some very modern twists on that as well which i think uh, is really good i think it's a great armchair book as well to kind of sit there and look at the pictures and be a bit of an armchair traveller and appreciate someone else's kind of point of view and where they live and hear some of the stories from Africa as well told by the people who live there. So that is my glowing review of uh, Mzansi South Africa on my needles and there is a map in the book so you can see where each of the patterns have been inspired. There's quite a lot of the country that's not covered um, by this knitting pattern book, which I sincerely hope, Sally, if you're listening, means there will be a follow-up to this because I would love to see more of the country through Andre's lens, really. And um, if you look, um, where I used to live is the orange uh, province on the map it's right right at the top and I do miss it and uh, the people in South Africa terribly I don't mind <laughs> I don't mind putting that out there at all so that is Mzanzi South Africa on my needle but on my needles by Sally Cameron it is available now it is priced at $28 for a hard copy plus the ebook um plus then that will be plus postage for anyone that's a South, not South African national Within South Africa, it's 315 Rand inclusive of postage, or you can just get the ebook version, which is a full colour ebook for $20, and that's downloadable through Ravelry. Um, if you would like to contact Sally about any of this, she is Pink Hair Girl on pretty much all social media, and you can find out more information about the book, in particular at www.pinkhairgirl.com. Sally blogs at pinkhairgirl.co.za so if you want to go over there and have a read of her ordinary blog you can go over there for that and you can find her podcast episodes uh, through that so that's my review of Nsanzi South Africa on my needles heartily recommend it and uh, well done Sally on getting it finished it looks excellent
So as I promised, I have a new giveaway for you after the spectacular giveaway sponsored by Claire and Jess in episode 22. And I am thrilled that Linda of Coach House Yarns uh, has very kindly sent me this skein to have a look at and do a quick review of and uh, to be able to offer this to you as a giveaway prize. Linda is a long-time listener of the show and uh, she's recently branched out into dyeing her own yarns under her name of Coach House Yarns because she lives in an old converted coach house so it kind of makes sense and uh, I know she's got some very exciting bases in the wings that she's told me about and uh, what she sent for me to have a look at is her everyday base which is a four ply 75% wool and 25% nylon 35% of which is BFL it comes in at 437 yarns and the yards yarns bleh, at yards and the colorway uh, name of this is tiger tiger now in my job at the golden skin I get to see a lot of yarn as you all know uh, I do like a bit of yarn I'm not a snob, I can appreciate the eyelash, but I like the I do like the finer things in life as well. And uh, when this came through the post and I opened it, the first thing I said was, ooh, uh, which is always a good sign because um, it, it really is that kind of skein. It's a very, very fun colourway. Uh, Tiger Tiger, um, it's the name of a pub, isn't it? It's the name of a bar. I remember going there in Newcastle and I think they've got one in Manchester as well and I remember going there with the boys when I used to be in the Air Force going to Tiger Tiger and the colourway uh, is is based on the stripes and colours of, of a tiger and uh, there's, or it, it varies from kind of really pale orange all the way through to a kind of dark rust so it's a, a variegated yarn but it's not a mental variegated it's quite tonal colourway and I think this would knit up into really fun, beautiful socks. You could probably get away with a patterned sock with this because it isn't so hectically variegated. And it's got a lovely kind of bounce uh, to the handle when you feel it. I haven't knitted it, obviously, because I'm going to give it away. <laughs> and that would be kind of pointless because it wouldn't be anywhere near so pretty thereafter. But within that, you're obviously getting your BFL 35%. A third of it is BFL, so you're getting that strength and luster that you get with a BFL yarn, as well as the 25% nylon is going to give you hard wearing uh, properties. And then I assume the other 40% um, will be merino uh, in this yarn. So it's not the normal blend, you're getting a bit of merino and, and BFL and your nylon for your socks. And I think it would be really good to go with our sock segment that's going to be coming up after this and we're going to be starting knitting our socks uh, early in January so this is available to give away to one lucky listener and to enter the competition all you need to do is to go over to Linda's shop on Etsy which is www.etsy.com slash shop slash coach house yarns all one word have a look at the stuff she's got up in there and tell me which one of those is your favourite colourway. And if you can post that in the Ravelry group for me, then you'll get an entry. And if you tweet it to me, then you'll get another one. And if you Facebook me, you'll get another one. And if you leave a comment on the blog, you'll get another. And if you Instagram me, then you'll get another one. And I will put a little picture up on Instagram for you to have a look at. So I'll just um, repost that and tag me so I know that you've done it and uh, I'll give you another entry for that as well so uh, share the love a little bit on the old social media and if you tell me which is your favourite then uh, I'll I'll put you in the raffle for a draw it's nice, it's going to make some really cool socks actually and it would work very nicely with Claire's pattern that we were talking about earlier, the Josie pattern so I think my favourite colourway while we're on is the Hoggle one, she did a load of colourways based on Labyrinth, the film, you know, with David Bowie, with the socks down his front of his pants. Have you ever noticed that? In Labyrinth, he has a massive package. He has, like, grey leggings and a massive package. It must be, it must be enhanced. It can't all be his. It's just not possible. And there are lots and lots of hilarious crotch shots all the way through it. Now, the first hundred times I watched this film... 
I didn't know about this, but Kate, as in Socks Kate, very helpfully pointed out that there's hundreds of gratuitous crotch shots within this film. In fact, there's a whole drinking game based around how many fingers of beer you drink when you see a crotch shot on Labyrinth. Um, I'll post the rules to that in the show notes. I'll make a note of it now. And um, I've never been able to get past it since. But she's done a lot of really cool colourways based on the um, the film, you know, scenes within the film and also the posters and things that advertised it. It's really cool. There's some really nice blues in there as well. But I really like the Hoggle colourway because um, Hoggle's quite funny. He's a little a little character in there. I also like the little guy with the, the hair, the little worm. No, you don't want to go that way. That way, go straight to the castle. So I quite like him too. And obviously Sir Didymus and Ambrosius. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll link to it in the show notes. Apparently there's going to be a remake. There's going to be a Labyrinth 2. Um, but I will link to that in the show notes. If you haven't seen it, then you really, really must treat yourself and just watch it. It's perfect Christmas watching. Um, really good fun film uh, with David Bowie and uh, Jennifer Connelly as a young girl. So um, we were talking about Coach Arshaz before we got completely distracted by Labyrinth, but um, go and check her out. Have a look at her shop. She's got a lot of exciting things coming up. And uh, if you want to be with the chance of winning the Tiger Tiger colourway, um, then you can enter as brief before. Um, so we're back again this week and I'm joined by uh, Claire and Kate after our intro to How to Choose Yarn two weeks ago. They're back again and we're going to be talking this week about uh, how to choose needles. For your Hello. projects. So, hi, Jo. Hi. Claire, are you still there? I am. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, so I'll hand over to Claire, who is the maestro in all these things, um, and we can start chatting about needles. So, as with yarn, I think this is probably going to become my catchphrase, but not all needles are created equal. And there are lots and lots of different choices. And I think sometimes this can be a little overwhelming when you're first starting out, which types of needles you should choose, which methods you should use, what are the sort of positives about those, where are the shortfalls or the pitfalls. But I'd be quite interested to hear from Kate what her questions are in relation to needles or what kind of needles you're currently working with, Kate, and, and then we can take it from there. Yeah, when I made my first socks, it was based on a tutorial that just said to use some 2.25 millimeter DPNs. That was all the advice that I was given. So then when I actually went to look for something, I didn't know how long they needed to be or what they were should be made of. And I got some bamboo ones. Actually, I bought some for Jo as well. I think she's going to mirror this story. Um, the, one of them bent very quickly and two of them have snapped and they've been disregarded and replaced. So it's been a little bit of trial and error. Okay. And, yeah, and I, I you... hooked mine as well. <laughs> oh, dear. How did you find um, working on double-pointed needles? Um, or have you only ever knitted <laughs> socks on double-pointed needles? I had for quite a long time. I've moved on a little bit now, but I've been mainly using double-pointed needles because that's generally what the patterns I've looked at have said, and I don't really know how to transfer my patterns on into a different method but at first it took me about five goes of trying and frogging to join in the round even um but actually using the dpns wasn't too scary it looks harder than it is i think absolutely i think it's one of those things that you've got all of these sort of almost when they're that small i think they remind me of pickup sticks you've got all of these sticks just going all over the place and it can look quite intimidating. But once you've got going, um, it's, I think it's quite intuitive. And I think it's one of those things that sort of once you've established a rhythm, as with most things in knitting, I think once you've established a rhythm and you find your own, your own sort of rhythm, it, it gets a lot easier. Um, I think if we start at the top, I think most people come to knitting socks with double pointed needles. I always swore I wouldn't ever knit socks, um, which is a story for another time. But one of the reasons why I didn't want to knit socks is because I was scared of the pickup sticks. And I just thought, I don't even know what I'm going to do with all of those like tiny little pieces of wood. Um, so I just didn't knit socks for a long time. 
And um, I think it puts people off. So I do want to sort of stress to people that double pointed needles are fine, but it's not the only method for knitting socks. So I've got four main methods that I think are our main sort of sock knitting methods. I'm not sure if there are any others, though I'm sure if there are, someone will let me know. So we have double pointed needles, which are short little sticks, um, and they usually come in a set of five. Then you've got magic loop, which we use a long circular needle for. And then you can use two circular needles, two long circular needles, or a very small circular needle. And those are the four main methods for knitting socks. In all honesty, I think people either knit with double pointed needles or with magic loop. Though we are seeing quite a lot of interest in the small circular needle, um, which I don't get on with at all. So that's sort of a summary, I suppose. If we talk about your double pointed needle, so you said you had bamboo needles and they yes. all broke. Yes. Now, um, at least two of them have. <laughs> I replaced them with some laminated birch ones. They're very colourful, quite pretty, okay. and they seem a bit more sturdy. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the needles, you can either choose wooden needles, which will either be bamboo or, or the sort of fancier ones, like you've got the laminated birch, or metal needles. Um, or there are some different kinds of needles, like carbon fibre needles, but mainly you're looking at wood or metal. You need to think carefully about what you prefer. Again, it's a, a big preference thing. Some people prefer working with wooden needles. But the downfall of wooden needles is they break quite easily, especially 2.25s. Um, metal needles are less likely to break, um, though they do bend if you sit on them. And um, that's rather uncomfortable, but that's just a random <laughs> side, side bit there. Um, but they are sometimes harder to handle, and some metal needles are heavier than others. So think about those things when you're picking them. And if you have wooden needles and you're not getting on with them, try metal needles. If you have metal needles and you find they're quite heavy, um, try wooden needles. Again, it's, it's very much a sort of trial and error and, and finding something that works for you. He talks a little bit about length. I would recommend 15 centimeters, which I've quickly had to check is six inches. Now, That's what I've got. Although yeah. I think you could get 12 or 15 centimeters. You can often get 10 centimetres. Maybe it was 10. Yeah, which I made the mistake of once buying some 10 centimetre DPNs. They're quite difficult to work with. Um, but they're fine if you're doing things like fingers on gloves. But I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't use them for socks, but, but they, pe some people might get on with them. You also sometimes get 20 centimetre DPNs, which I personally would find a little too long. But at the end of the day, it's all about what works for you. Now, I know when we spoke before, you spoke about um, ladders and the problem of getting a little gap in between. Yes, I feel like when I go between needles, the, the stitch there is getting a bit stretched. Even when I try to make sure that I'm pulling it really tight as I go around the corner, kind of, it still kind of feels like it's, it's wide. It's not so noticeable as it moves down. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's really there or if it's just imaginary. I think there's two things that are very interesting there for you. One is that are, are they really there or are they imaginary? Because at the join, it is going to be more more pronounced um, because there is a stress on, on the sort of yarn and the stitches, which pulls them apart. So it makes any gap look more pronounced. When you're first starting out, it's likely that you probably do have a gap there. And it's what we term a ladder. Um, there are a number of different ways to reduce the chances of ladders. Um, and reduce the, the sort of size and the prominence of them in your socks. The first one is it is about attention. It, it's a tension issue. And I think it's interesting that you said you tried to pull it as tight as possible. I think often when we're setting out, we think if you have a gap, if we pull it tightly, if we pull tightly on the yarn, that that will make the gap smaller. And it kind of does make that gap smaller, but it puts stress somewhere else. So I right. wouldn't advocate for pulling really tight on that last stitch um, because I think it's counterproductive. What you're aiming for is an even tension and that's about practice. So the first thing here is your ladders will diminish with practice. And I know that's not what people who have ladders in their first sock want to hear, um, but it's the truth is that it will get better over time. There are some things you can do to make it easier to reduce those ladders when you're starting out. 
How many double pointed needles were you working with? So the knitting was spread over three and I had a fourth one that I was working with. Okay. I think I, at that stage. I would advocate for knitting with five needles. I know people are thinking, why are we adding an extra pickup stick here? I really don't need anything more to think about. But if you stretch your sock or your your if you um distribute your stitches over four needles, while there are more points of stress because you've then got four gaps they are there's less stress on those gaps as opposed to if you have three and it's a triangle the gaps have far greater stress placed on them so I can think that makes sense because of the size of the angle I don't know if I'm explaining this very well I sort of imagine my engineering husband just rolling his eyes at my ridiculous descriptions of shapes and stresses anyway I digress apologies um so what you actually want to do is work over four needles and use your fifth needle to knit. That will immediately help with that ladder issue. Um, remember not to pull things very tight. And then the final trick is something that we also use in Magic Loop because people also find that they get ladders in Magic Loop. And that's moving those gaps. Now, it's much easier than it seems. I find people get themselves in a bit of a pickle about where the stitches should be and how many stitches should be on each needle and moving things around. Um, I'm going to do a blog post because it's much easier to explain in pictures um, what I mean. But what you do is you move that gap. So every few rows or every few rounds even, you'll knit a few stitches on so that you're moving your gap so that your gap will then be moved onto a needle and your gap will be in a new place. So then I have done that. Yes. Did you find it helped? Yes, I did that with my second socks because that pattern didn't tell me how many stitches to put on each needle. Okay. So I didn't really know how to set it up to start with, whereas the initial pair of the tutorial, it was exactly step by step, these stitches on this needle, these stitches on the next needle. But when I didn't have that guidance, it was quite scary not really knowing how to set it up. But then I did what you said because I was worried about the gap, so I just kept moving it to make the distribution of stitches even or then make it easier to see where the pattern was starting. Absolutely. And that's what's important is having a reasonably even distribution and being able to read your pattern. So you may move things around for all sorts of reasons. And I'll put some detailed diagrams in the blog post. But I think the important thing for me is not worrying too much about where your stitches are. As long as you know what those stitches are, so as long as you know which stitches are going to become your heel and where the start of your round is, um, it doesn't matter how they're set out over those needles, as long as they're evenly distributed, um, it's fine, in, in, in my opinion. Sorry, as well as having my needle breakages, I had some other minor DPN issues. I say minor, we might be thinking major and crying. And that when I put my project away into the bag, I came to get it out and found that a needle had actually just come out completely. At which point I then went and bought some, like, rubber stopper things to put on the ends mm -hmm. and that obviously has helped but um yeah I've also had the same thing happen while I was knitting although there may have been a little bit of wine involved yes wine and knitting with the base <laughs> of the combination um this is what I don't really knit socks on double pointed needles um for that reason is I'm quite clumsy and I always seem to manage to drop one of them or drop all my stitches or lose the fifth needle so I'll find like all four of my needles on the sock, but my fifth needle is nowhere to be found, which kind of makes knitting slightly difficult. Yes, you're right, Kate. And um, those little rubber stoppers would be a great addition to anyone's DPN collection. Um, as we were also saying, you can buy those um, little tubes. It's sort of, I can't really, I'm describing it here with my hands, which is not very helpful because no one can see them. It's a little case that goes over all of your DPNs. You put the DPN, the, the spare one, the fifth one in there and you sort of sandwich it along the top so you've got your socks sitting out at the bottom and that's great for transporting your DPN projects. Or, I haven't even seen one of those. Hmm, I'll have to love they, they do, yeah, you, they do sell them. I'll, I'll have to find some links and send them to you. Um, or you could just use Magic Loop. I can. I, I, I am can. a little biased. Um, but that would stop you from losing your DPNs, just magic loop them. Because I know you recently did a magic loop course, Kate. How did that go? I did. I did a workshop at my local yarn shop. The lady there was, um, was teaching a group of people. And it was, yeah, it was, it was really good. I thought it was going to be 
quite scary. Um, but actually, it was once after a little bit of practice, it was quite simple, just required a bit of concentration to start with. For my needle, I actually sought advice from the lady at Unwind again. That's where I've got all of my hints and tips from so far, I would say. So I just have one, 100 centimetre, I think it is, um, cape, no, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Circular needle Ooh. with steel tips. Okay. And it's which got quite a thin it? plastic cable. Uh-huh. Which is that, which brand is that? That's a higher, higher needle. Oh, oh. I'm very happy to hear that. That makes me smile. Um, so Magic Loop is, it is magical. Deed is magical, but it's not as intimidating as people may think. Um, I will do a roundup. It's kind of a difficult technique to describe um, without some kind of visual cues. I'll do a roundup of some of the best tutorials I think are around on the internet because some are far easier to follow than others. Um, I think it works really well for socks. It makes socks really transportable and um, it's it's really easy to um, put any sock pattern onto Magic Loop. Um, and I can write up some notes when I do how you distribute your stitches on a DPN. I'll write up just a couple of lines of notes on how you would take a DPN pattern and put it into Magic Loop. So you'll have all of those um, hints and tips there. Now, the one thing I think, and, and I'm glad you raised the point about your needles um, that you bought and wind. The most important thing for me, if you're going to knit socks with Magic Loop, is to think about the needles that you're choosing. And I often feel that people think I'm saying you must buy expensive needles when I say this to them at my workshops in Edinburgh. But it's not about um, the price you pay for your needles. It's about the quality of your cable. So the example I always give is Chowgoos, and I know that Joe is a um, big fan, have wonderful needles. They're absolutely beautiful. I have some. I love them. They're not for Magic Loop. I cannot make them work for Magic Loop. And the reason that is, is because they have that really beautiful nylon coated steel cable, that signature red cable that just doesn't bend enough for Magic Loop. So they're great for all sorts of things, but I wouldn't advise them for Magic Loop. Um, In in the same vein, some of the cheaper needles have quite fat, squishy cables. They're almost a hollow cable. I find that quite difficult for Magic Loop, especially with a finer finer yarn that you'll use for knitting socks. My advice would be to choose something that's quite flexible and reasonably thin. Higher, higher, have a great cable. Um, Nip Pro or Nip Picks, depending on whether you're buying them in Europe or the States, um, have a great cable. And Addy, I believe, has a good flexible cable as well. Someone has a siren there. Sorry, that died. (laughs) My nerves thought that was my toddler coming home because she obviously (laughs) sounds like a siren. You can see what she's done to to my brain. Um, Yes, so a a flexible cable is really important. And if you do have kinks in your cable or a, a curly cable from it being in the packaging, you can soak it in some warm water. And I often find that sort of evens things out. So that will help you in making Magic Loop easier. And it will also help reduce any ladders. And and the same things that I spoke about for ladders with double-pointed needles are are relevant for ladders with Magic Loop. Um, And I'll pop lots of hints and tips on the blog um, over the next two weeks. So you'll have lots of places of reference once you listen to the podcast. And then the last needle I'll talk about, I won't talk about two circulars because I think that's just a little bit too much for today, is the mini circular needle I don't know if you've seen these Kate um no I've seen pictures of people using them on RAV possibly but I just yeah I don't understand because I would have thought that you needed slightly more metal needle which would then not really form part of the really small circle very easily it is tricky the the metal part on them is tiny it's about an inch two and a half three centimeters long if memory um serves me correctly there and um, while I know that a lot of people love them I really think that this is the marmite of knitting needles because you either love them or you loathe them Um, I tried some I really wanted to make it work I thought I was going to knit these vanilla socks in my spare time at the speed of light and it was going to be brilliant and what actually happened is I ended up with terrible wrist ache and um, it was pretty horrendous. So I have quite weak wrists. I do need to be careful about how much knitting I do and what kinds of um, 
activities I do in terms of how much computer use I have, etc. And these needles don't do me any favors. So I think if you're thinking about trying them out, um, maybe don't use them for your first pair of socks, because I think that's adding a whole load of extra um, technique there that you don't need. If you have weak wrists or RSI, I'd advise against them. Um, but give them a whirl if you want something different, if you've knitted Magic Loop or DPNs. I know that there are many people out there who are really championing them as great ways to knit um, very quick um, vanilla socks or, or, or slightly patterned socks. So um, Maybe you could borrow some from a friend or something to try out until you know whether you do or don't like them. Absolutely. If someone is really, really keen on trying them out, they can contact me. I have a beautiful pair of nine inch circulars that I would be happy to send to someone because they're just languishing at the bottom of my bag. Actually, Joe, we can do a giveaway of my nine inch circulars. <laughs> They've been used to knit 10 rounds of a sock and um, I'm never going to use them. So there you go. Someone can trial the new um, nine inch circulars and hopefully you like them. And if you don't, maybe you could pass them on to someone else. What, needles touched by the actual Claire Divine? I know. <laughs> I don't know if that's a selling point. Um, <laughs> I just thought, yeah, um, because I'm never going to use them because I don't get on with them. We were talking about needles. We've talked about wooden needles and long needles and short needles and metal needles. Um, something that I didn't talk about was uh, square needles. And um, I want to pop this in because I think it's important for people who um, sometimes people are put off knitting socks because it can be at quite a tight gauge and uh, people who have weaker wrists or problems with their wrists find that socks agitate them. Um, I don't know if this is the absolute answer for that, but I've heard many good things about um, square needles, uh, knit picks, do knit picks, knit pro. I'm sorry, I always get confused which one we're actually working with in this country. Um, have cubics, and there are other square needles as well, and they're supposed to be much better in terms of how you hold them and how they um, work with. Or, sort of work with your wrists as opposed to against your wrists so if you are out needle shopping and you need to consider your wrists um maybe try some square needles especially for socks i think they might might do some favors so that's just a, an extra little side piece there so that's my summary with needles um i will do i think a lot of the topics we've talked about need some visuals especially how you split um, your stitches on DPNs, and um, how you get a magic loop set up. So I will do some roundups on the blog, and I'll post about them in Joe's um, podcast group on Ravelry, and Joe will link to them, and they'll be on social media. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this week. Apologies if that was a little bit choppy and changey at points. We had several calamities uh, during the course of recording that, including at one point um, the beast almost severing Sammy's little finger in the door, which caused a whole host of, uh, of ongoing issues, uh, including losing half of the recording. So um, it isn't the normal kind of standard that we will be working to, but unfortunately when you have three children in the mix, two dogs, a couple of errant husbands, uh, it can get a little bit tricky to uh, manage all of this in one go. So again, as usual, if you have any questions relating to all things Socky, please do get in touch and we will answer your questions on the show if um, if you do have any. So please feel free to give us your feedback for that. And I hope you'll all have a great week. Thank you very much for listening. Happy crafting and speak to you all again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Shiny Bees podcast. Show notes to this episode can be found on the blog at www.shinybees.com. I'm Shiny Bees on Ravelry, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest and Facebook, so feel free to give me a shout. Or you can email me at shinybeesinfo at gmail.com. Music for this episode is provided courtesy of Music Alley and is by Adam and the Waltz Boys. It's I Need a Drink. Need a friend, I need your help.